Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Holly Digress, and I am a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Middle East programs. The Iran Strategy Project is proud to bring you today's discussion on what Iranian protesters can learn from other pro-democracy movements. Emsal Salehune, Sayyid Ali Sarnagune. This year is the year of blood. Sayyid Ali Khamenei will be overthrown. Khamenei Ghatale Velayatish Batale. Khamenei is a murderer and his guardianship is invalid. These are some of the chants heard during the ongoing protests since the murder of Massa Gina Amini by the so-called morality police in mid-September 2022. Contrary to the lack of Western media coverage, these protests calling for the end of the Islamic Republic have been continuous. Just the other week, on February 16th, protests rocked numerous Iranian cities marking the 40th day death anniversaries of two executed protesters, Mohammad Mehdi Karimi and Sayyid Mohammad Mohosseini. According to the organization Human Rights Activists in Iran, more than 529 have been killed and more than 19,000 have been arrested. These numbers are people accounted for and verified. Rights organizations believe them to be much higher. As the protests begin to enter their sixth month, it is integral to look outward at other countries as case studies in the pursuit of freedom. I've invited pro-democracy activists from Syria, Sudan, and Venezuela to discuss lessons from their lived experiences in their respective countries. You may be wondering, why these countries specifically? Well, Syria, Sudan, and Venezuela often come up in conversations about Iran's future, in part because of a history of sanctions, oil wealth, and relative international isolation. While their situations are in flux, I should add the caveat that in no shape or form am I suggesting that Iran is on the same trajectory or will lead to the same outcome. This session is one for learning and one of many to come on the topic of democratization in Iran. I'd like to give a brief overview of each country's history in recent years before we began. In 2011, uprisings sprung up in the Middle East and North Africa, inspiring Syrians to oust the Assad regime, which had been ruling since 1971. The country had been plagued by economic inequality, repression, corruption, and drought, pushing Syria towards instability. Syrian pro-democracy demonstrators demanded that Bashar al-Assad step down, but the violent response by the regime spread the unrest. As some opposition activists took weapons to defend themselves against attacks by the regime, by early 2012, the events had turned into a civil war. Foreign powers took sides in the conflict by sending fighters, money, and weaponry to opposition militias, while longstanding allies, Russia and Iran, supported and military backed the Assad regime to keep it in power. Meanwhile, between 2014 and 2020, ISIS capitalized on the violence and chaos and established its own caliphate across Syria and Iraq. Today, Syria is divided up into roughly three separate entities, and there are 13.6 million Syrians displaced with roughly a million killed. A little over a decade after the conflict, Syria's Arab neighbors are slowly normalizing ties with the Assad regime. In 2018, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir brought about austerity measures and sharply devalued the national currency, driven by years of lost oil revenue and U.S. sanctions. Prompted by grassroots organizational work that commenced in their 2013 uprisings, protesters, led by women, um, took to the streets by the end of 2018. After months of nonviolent protests, Bashir, who had been in power for three decades, was ousted in a military coup. The military junta announced a military council that would run the country for two years. Having learned lessons from the Arab Spring, protesters were discontent that their country underwent a military takeover, not democratic civilian rule, and continued to protest. After weeks of a standoff, in August 2019, the military junta and pro-democracy movement agreed to a power-sharing government, the Sovereign Council, which would rule for the next few years. The move prompted the U.S. to delist Sudan as a state sponsor of terror in 2020 and also included the promise of more aid packages. Then, in October 2021, the military returned to power, dissolving the Transitional Sovereign Council. Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who led the 2021 coup, has announced elections for July 2023. Finally, in 2017, in the backdrop of a failing economy marred by corruption and mismanagement, overspending, and low oil prices, protesters took to the streets in Venezuela against President Nicolas Maduro, handpicked a successor by the late Hugo Chavez. In 2018, Maduro was elected in what international observers and the opposition called a fraudulent election. A year later, in 2019, opposition leader Juan Guaido was proclaimed interim president of the National Assembly based on powers given to him by the Venezuelan constitution. Guaido led countless anti-government protests and at one point had the recognition of some 60 governments worldwide, including the US. 
The Maduro government recently renewed relations with its neighbor, oh, excuse me, um, a, okay. Over time, the movement to oust Maduro lost steam with fractures eventually appearing in the opposition movement. By 2022, only a few countries recognized Guaido. The Maduro government recently renewed relations with its neighbors and the US has opened direct line of communication and provided sanctions relief. Now the opposition is attempting to unseat Maduro in the 2024 presidential election. We have a lot of ground to cover with these three respectable pro-democracy activists. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Genesis Davila is an international law human rights fellow at the United Nations. She is also the founder and president of Defiande Venezuela, an NGO dedicated to pro bono legal assistance to victims of human rights violations. Ibrahim El Asil is a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. He is also a founding member of the Syrian Nonviolence Movement, which was formed in 2011 to promote nonviolence as a way to achieve social and political change in Syria. And finally, Maha Tambal is a Reagan Fassel Democracy Fellowship alumna at the National Endowment for Democracy. She was a training and partnership coordinator at Red R UK in Khartoum, where she worked to advance civil society's capacity to play a vital role in the 2019 democratic transition in Sudan and to strengthen its political participation. Um, before I start, I would like to let you all know that Q&A is available. Um, we will be handing an iPad out later, and of course there's stuff that uh, there, you can ask Q&A um, online. Um, so I'm gonna get right to it. So when we think about Iran, um, we think about uh, Masa Amini's murder as a tipping point. Um, mm -hmm. But when you look back, there's a number of things that led to a point of no return, whether it was the shoot down of a Ukrainian passenger airliner by the IRGC killing 176 on board, to the denial of Western vaccines to Iranians, and of course the bloody um, protests in which security forces killed and arrested thousands in November 2019. Um, all three of your countries have faced tyrants, um, but there was a tipping point too. So what led to that no um, point of no return for your respective countries. I'm gonna go with you, Genesis, first. Thank you so much. Yes, well, in Venezuela, the greatest period of protest that we have ever had was in 2017. And the point of not return was when the Supreme Court issued two rulings, passing the powers of the legislative branch to the executive branch. That was the moment when Venezuelans say, stop, we cannot handle this anymore. And then all Venezuelans went to the streets to protest. And of course, we have to add to this situation a humanitarian crisis that Venezuela has been living for many years. Ibrahim. Uh, first, Holly, thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor. We had a lot of conversations since the early days, me, you, and some of your colleagues, Gisu, Jumana, and Qutayba, about what, what Iran really could, could learn and also what other countries could um, um, could share with Iran. And for the tipping point, I'm gonna offer a different perspective where I would say that revolutions usually, while you can see on the national level some tipping points, what you could call a tipping point, it's also very, very personal. Usually when you ask people, every different, every single person has a different tipping point. And it's rare even if you ask Syrians to agree on a tipping point. First, of course, because we rarely agree on anything. But second, because every person went through a different journey. Some people, it was when they saw somebody being killed in front of them. Yes. Somebody when they actually saw a protest. Some people, it was when they actually participated in the protest. And I'll, I'll end with this note about that, which uh, I, I know many protesters would, uh, would relate to that. When you go in, a, in an authoritarian country and you protest and you hear your voice and you see your hand going up and you see people around you chanting something that you never, ever expected to hear it in the streets of Tehran, in the streets of Damascus, in other cities around the world. Many people, when they did that, for them, it was the tipping point. They're like, after I experienced that, there is no way for me I can go back to where I was and I can be silenced again. Yeah. I agree. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Holly. Thank you for having all of us. And thank you for Atlantic Council for this you know, opportunity. I would second what Abraham mentioned, and that was a trigger for me personally since 2013. But I would add to that, when citizens felt frustrated and really wanted to call for change, sometimes they needed to have any form of leadership. If they found that leadership that could help them to 
decide and go out on the streets, they will never go back. And that really happened in 2018 when we had the Sudanese Professional Association, which is uh, um, a body that composed of trade unions, associations, and, um, and civil society. So they have been forming a, a kind of alliance. They call it Sudanese Professional Association. And it started to call for people, you know, here is your leadership. You are not alone. Everybody has their own frustration. They wanted to express it. So that was really um, a point of no return when we found that form of leadership, despite it has its own you know, cons and, and pros. But it was that moment when you feel like you are not alone. You have something organized that can help you to express what you want to and to plan to for what you want to do. It's funny you bring up leadership because that was going to be one of my questions. Um, actually, one of the biggest debates right now on the topic of Iran is whether Iran's revolution should be led by one leader or a coalition. Um, so Genesis, I'd love to hear more about this in the context of Venezuela. And um, what, are, what are the strengths and weaknesses in having a single leader or, or a coalition? Like Looking back right now, would one be better than the other? And of course, this question's for all of you, but I'll go with you first. Well, I, I think this is very complicated, you know, because when you have a team, when you have a group, you have to organize all the the, the, the willingness of the members of the group, but when you have a leader, then you have one target, you know? And then that could uh, be very risky for the general purpose that you have, you know, for your fight. Because if you have just one leader, then everything depends on that person. Mm -hmm. And that is very risky. When we are in the middle of protests, when we are creating movements, the goal must be to include as much persons as possible, you know, because here it is not about one person. When we are fighting against a tyranny, when we are fighting against a dictatorship, you need the willingness of all the population, you know? So I find that is better and that is also stronger when, when you fight together. Um, by together, you need to understand that it is not only about politicians, it's about the whole civil society, you know? And everybody has to identify from where they can contribute with this fight, you know? You have to identify your place. And from that place, you have to make your contributions. And you have to respect the space of others. Otherwise, it will never work, you know? Because then they are, at the moment, in power. So they have advantage, you know? So we need to identify our strengths, and we need to fight together. Excellent points. I would build on, on that uh, point of Genesis, um, the inclusivity, and I would add three points when it comes to the leadership that is very important to have in any movement under authoritarian regime. First, you need the leadership that listens to people, that really tries to connect to people in the streets, the protesters, also the, the intelligentsia, also the middle class, also the, the diaspora, the journalists around the world, and really tries to incorporate that, not only to pretend they are listening, but actually to show them that we are listening, we are trying to learn from you, and we are trying to know what you want. Second, while a leadership, it's important to listen to the street, it's important to lead, not to follow the streets. And these are, it's, it's a very, very important nuance, because, a leadership should offer a vision. You listen to the street. You try to see what they are asking for. But then you try to think what's important at this point and the priorities. And then you are courage enough to go and talk to people and sometimes tell them, no, that's too much. No, that's too little. No, what about we do this? What about we do that? A true leadership is the one that points out some of the mistakes of the movement, not tries always to hide the weaknesses and pretend everything is fine until the whole movement actually collapses. So to listen, to lead, and number three, to empower a new generation to come up. Because usually when it starts, it's usually the older generation of people who knew each other, who have been probably outside Iran for a long time, trying to bring about change. But now it's time also to transfer that leadership. So when the people in the streets see that the leadership is actually trying to include and empower in new faces and include them, I think that helps with trust. And I think that helps that they actually lead and for people to, to listen and to follow. Yeah, thank you so much, Ibrahim. I think the point of bringing a new generation is a kind of a dilemma for Arab countries. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, don't, they don't delegate other younger generations to participate in leadership. 
But um, um, yeah, coalitions are important to lead change. And revolution is kind of, you know, a collective work. So you cannot have an individual leader because it's going to recall back the legacy of individuality of your dictator that you are now resisting, you wanted to ouster. But again, you need to make sure that this coalition or this kind of group leadership, it has its own arrangements, it has its own governing rules to make sure that segregating your own interest and the group interest. I mean, that's one of the problems when we had the um, the FFC coalition, the Forces uh, for Freedom and Change. It was a body composed of political parties, civil society, trade unions, and so on. So they mixed up. They mixed up their political interest. They mixed up the street interest. They mixed up with even the military council interest. So when they get into negotiation to have a, a transitional government, they were lost. They didn't manage to have like a, a very good agreement that really represents the voice of the people. So it's really important to make sure that all members of that coalition having their own segregation between their political interest and the collective interest for transition. So I mean, yeah, this is one of the lessons actually we learned. You brought up um, people and their voices and makes me think about civil society. What role did civil society play, um, especially women and youth, in the fight for freedom? I think the role of civil society is very important, you know? For example, in Venezuela, right now, the regime is attacking civil society because they identify us as their enemy. Why? Well, because we are there to report what they are doing, you know? We are there to file the violations of human rights that they are committing. So after they attack all the politicians and they pretty much destroy the opposition, now they are attacking civil society because it's the only front that they have right now, you know? So some of the lessons that we have learned in Venezuela and that we can share uh, with the Iranians to, to understand how to build better this pro-democracy movement is that, well, for example, the protest must be pacific, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. Because if the protests are not pacific, then you are giving the state the opportunity to repress, you know? And I know that they are repressing already. The same happened in Venezuela. But if the protests are not organized in a pacific way, then they have an excuse to, mm -hmm. to, to, to repress in a greater way, you know? And then also something that is very important, and here is the most important role of civil society, is that you have to document all human rights violations, you know? We cannot trust that these regimes are reporting the violations that they are committing because they are the responsible of the violations, you know? So it is not their interest to document these human rights violations. And here is where civil society have a paramount role because if we don't report this, then it will be no records of these violations. Then it's also very important to build up the capacity of civil society. Why? Well. These regimes, they are, in a daily basis, improving their techniques to repress, to attack, you know, to remain in power. So we have to do the same on the other side, you know? We have to train civil society. We have to train reporters. We have to train organizations and even the families of those who were killed or are right now in arbitrary detention, you know? We have to teach them how they can claim justice. And then it's also important to create security plans. And also, we have to renew our vows daily. You know, like every day when you wake up to fight against a tyranny, you have to ask yourself this question. Am I still able to do this? I have the strength. Do I have the power? Do I have the conviction? And if the answer is no, then it's okay, you know? And you have to respect the answer of the rest because this requires a daily commitment. And when you feel that this is too much to handle, it's okay also to stop, you know? Even for one second, if you need to like charge your energy, you know? And finally, I will say that we have to work 
in a very collaborative way, you know, at the national level, but also at the international level. When we are fighting against human rights violations, we have to understand that the mechanisms are not regular, you know? You have to organize those who are on the ground, you know? And you have to find support from organizations, and then you have to file cases nationally, but also internationally. And then you need to find international support from international organizations and also from other governments, you know? But this is a fight that must include as much people as possible. And if we don't learn how to do this, then it's impossible to fight against these regimes. Exactly, F fascinating points. And I would add that to, to the point of pacifism, that nonviolence allows everyone to do something. Yes. When things become violent, only one segment of society can actually do something. And the rest, it's not only they become excluded, they actually pay a price that they didn't agree with. Nobody should be forced to do anything, including to be free, yeah. because it defies the, defy, uh, the, the whole purpose. If we are forcing people to join a protest, then we are forcing them to do something that against their will, they are not free. We are just replacing some system of oppression with another, especially if you are starting that way. And then other people will be watching and they'll be like, oh, if you are the underdog and you are treating us that way, what would you do when you become the government? You are just gonna become yeah. another system of oppression. Mm -hmm. And at least this is the devil we know. And that's exactly what happened in Syria, by the way, when the revolution started to become militarized and then Islamized and then jihadized and all of that. People started, many people who joined the revolution in 2011, especially in the urban centers and the middle class, started to move and, and to, to walk away from the revolution, feeling that it's too risky for them. They thought that it's less risky to actually allow the government to stay rather than to come up with something they don't know what it is. And that's why, as Genesis said, that usually governments and regimes, the first thing they do is to attack civil society and peaceful protesters, even before the ones who want probably to do anything violent, because they are, they are offering, offering an alternative. They are offering a vision, and they are offering tools that those governments, they don't know how to respond to. They know how to respond to, to violent protests, but they don't know to how to, to, to respond to peaceful techniques, especially when you can include many people, when you can include uh, uh, poor and rich and people in the urban areas and rural, men and women, uh, uh, young and, uh, and old. And you know, Maha also kept talking about that revolution is a collective effort. We really need to think about if, if a movement wants to succeed, it needs to think about how can I include more and more people every single day. Yeah. That's the challenge. The regime is trying to deactivate your supporters. You are trying to activate your supporters and deactivate their supporters. Sometimes you don't want people to become pro your revolution or pro protest or uprising, but you just want them to give you the space. You just tell them, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to let you or to tell you how to live, but can you let me express how I want to live and what, uh, uh, and what I want to do? And my final point here too is civil society is different than the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. Opposition is a political body. It's very important to be there and it's the one that actually could offer an alternative for the regime. The civil society is the one that monitors the regime and the opposition is the one who goes and tells everyone this is okay and this is not. It's the one that's not after populism, not after uh, people just to say, oh yeah, now this is the momentum, so I wanna be, sometimes the opposition with all respect to opposition. No, no revolution can win without an opposition, but it's not the opposition that brings the real change into society. It could bring a change to the government, but the civil society is the one who goes deep down and actually change the culture and brings up a different culture, a culture of inclusivity, and, and reminds the opposition that even one day, if you become in power, that doesn't mean you will just get uh, uh, a white check and you would do whatever you want. We will be there and we will monitor you and we'll document your violations as much as we document the violations of uh, the government or the regime. Yeah, I mean, great point, Ibrahim. That's kind of a challenge we have all, the definition of the civil society. Is political parties part of the civil society or not? It's a debate in Sudan and it never ends. The thing is, 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, the past 30 years, um, there is a huge repression on the political parties. So they used to have kind of civil society organizations to serve as front for them. And then they started to, you know, to work and integrate with the other civil society. And that creates the, the absence of the lines between the political interest and the mandate of the civil society. So it's important to have that segregation. But I think in Sudan also the civil society have been working great in documenting the violations. I mean, um, since the genocide mm -hmm. in Darfur, uh, the civil society started to strive submitting annually a shadow report of human rights violations to the UN um, um, Human Rights Council. And that's something continued to happen. And you know, Sudan has its government uh, representation um, in the council. And sometimes they bring counter reports. But the civil society used to, um, to provide this kind of documentation to let the international community know what really happens in Sudan. And also the civil society, one of the things that really civil society in Sudan did is you know, communication with the international community. International community always open to non-state actors. So through them, they can help you know, intervening and help people to identify tools for uh, peaceful protest, how to communicate. I mean, um, you speak about the role of youth and, and women. And I'm going to link it to the civil society, because Sudan is a kind of young country. Its population, more than 66 percentage of it under 35. So um, yeah, we have a lot of youth-led organizations in Sudan and youth-led civil society groups. So they started to arrange themselves to avoid the security repression, to, to avoid the Russian censorship technology that it provides to Sudan. Actually, my Twitter account has been suspended since 2018 because of this kind of you know, um, um, censorship. So they used to organize themselves in small groups um, per neighborhood where they know each other and they trust each other. So having these small groups, building trust, starting to, to decide how they will be contributing to this kind of revolution. As I mentioned, it's a collective work. And everybody needs to define their roles, how they're going to be in uh, participating in this. So being organized in small groups per neighborhood, that really helps them. And then they ended up have a, have a very well-known body, the resistance committees. It's, it's a body that really composed of youth and women. And they have been like trying to organize themselves all the time, putting barricades on the streets so as to prevent um, the security forces from, you know, attacking, and try to. Be That's kind of a peaceful resistance tool where they put barricades, where they can put like everything that they can block the road, so as they can run before the security forces catch them. Uh, I mean, this is one of the tools they have been founding, and it really helped to increase the security of people, to increase the willingness of, of people to participate because they are feeling, yeah, yeah, it's, it's secure. You know, we have the young guys are blocking all the roads, so we can, we can go outside, we can chant and everything. Um, for women, I mean, we used to have, since 2018 and up to now, we used to have like kind of weekly marches on the street. Um, and then it starts like 1 p.m. Sudan local time, and they call it 1 p.m. revolution time. So it starts with women. I'm going to say the word in Arabic. Alex, maybe you can help me. <laughs> Is it? I mean, yeah, like 1 p.m., a woman start to make zagruta. Mm -hmm. Zagruta is. <laughs> Sorry, I know exactly what you mean. So that's, um, well, that, that's expression of cheer and happiness. And it creates kind of momentum to people. Whenever, like, you know, 1 PM, you can see people sitting on cafes, walking on the streets. Not, there, is, there are no any kind of signs that people are going to walk or march. But at 1 PM, when women do that zagaruta, every person comes to the street. <laughs> so this is like kind of a great courage from them. Because most of the time, when it comes to 1 PM, all the streets are being surrounded by you know, heavy vehicles, security troops, tear gas and everything. So this is kind of a very courage role of them. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've heard both Maha and Genesis talk about the international community. So I think this is a great segment way to talk about that a bit. Um, what role did the international community play? And is there more that the US government could have done? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, awkward. <laughs> Depends on when and how, yeah. <laughs> and <true>. who. <laughs> Very true. But yes, OK, well, let's start with the international community. The international community plays an important role, because in our countries is the government, the regime that is attacking 
the population, you know? It is not a conflict between like parties, no. It's the regime that is in power that is attacking their citizens, you know? So we don't have a judicial system where we can claim something, you know? Because at the end, they are part of the same regime. So this population has not protection, you know? And this is why we have this important role that the international community plays. And that is also the reason why we have these organizations like United Nations, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the International Criminal Court, and many other bodies, you know? So for example, in Venezuela, an important role play was the one of the Organization of American States, you know? They start discussing the issue of protests in Venezuela for the first time in the world, you know? And that happens here. Why? Well, because Venezuela is part of this organization and the crisis of Venezuela not only affects Venezuela, you know, it also affects the rest of the countries in the region. Right now, Venezuela has the biggest refugees crisis mm. of the world, even bigger than the one in Syria and even bigger than the one in Ukraine, you know? And Venezuela is not in the middle of a war. So then we also have the, the participation of United Nations, like filing these important reports about what was happening in Venezuela, about human rights violations and crimes against humanity. And we have the International Criminal Court that right now has an ongoing investigation for crimes against humanity in Venezuela, you know? And these institutions, they are not only like giving a statements, you know, but actually their intervention is important for the regimes to stop what they are doing, you know? They actually respond to this pressure that they receive from abroad because at the end, they want to play like the good guys, you know? And they are still playing the game that they say they are not violating human rights, you know, that they are doing things because those things are the right way to, to respond, and it is not like that. So the international community plays a very important role. And as you mentioned at the beginning, how is the situation of Venezuela right now with the U.S.? Well, the U.S. played an important role against the Maduro regime for many years, you know? And now with the oil crisis, it is like they forgot about what is this regime about, you know? A, a regime of human rights violators, and they are again, like trying to have negotiations with the regime because of oil, you know? So that is disgusting. I mm -hmm. think that we cannot forget what we are fighting for here. And we are fighting for freedom and we are fighting for democracy. So this is something that nobody should forget. Thank you. Ibrahim. You know, it's, a, it's really a big question on, uh, on different levels. Um, Early 2000s, there was the argument that it's time to really include something in the UN to make it really a norm, which is the responsibility to protect that. Because the, the new world order or the world order we live now after World War II was built on the concept of sovereignty, that no other government has the right to intervene with another government. But then there was always the question, what if a government is failing in protecting its own people? And then what if is the government is the one that's yeah. killing its own people. That's still an ongoing debate. Unfortunately, today, it's way weaker than it used to be early 2000s. And especially uh, around Syria, that's when, when the US failed to even actually keep the red line that President Obama put, that the chemical weapons, uh, which was even, I think, a weak red line. What about other weapons? But at least President Obama then said, if you use chemical weapons, we're going to do something. Assad used chemical weapons, and he is still now receiving phone calls and congratulations from many of his allies, allies around the world because the earthquake he is using it now to even have in himself um, rehabilitated uh, in the region. I wouldn't actually over expect from governments, even though I'm a big believer in Western liberal democracies, but they are not built, and those governments are not elected to spread democracy around the world, and they don't. Civil societies do. People in the U.S. do. People in the government do. There are many people in the U.S. government who really, really, really care about Syria, about Iran, about Venezuela, about many places around the world. And they are there doing their job trying to make the world a better place. But the government, the concept of government is not to go and help another country. So I know it's painful to hear 
but I don't think they will show up. And people in, in Iran and around the world in the diaspora should not make their plans expecting the West to help them. It's your problem. And mainly, you are the only one who would be able to deal with it. You will have so many allies around the world who will support you in any and many different ways. But don't count so much on the governments, because again, even your regime has great power ally, Russia. China is not interested in allowing uh, a more friendly regime to come to Iran, because they want the US to, became, to remain distracted in the region, and so many regional and global dynamics. But human rights documentation, where some governments could help you, support civil society and train journalists, uh, create maybe ways to actually uh, go around uh, the censorship. Th those are things that the West could help and should help with that. And I think that what the focus should be on, like what civil society and what other things other than direct intervention, because that won't happen. And even if it happens, I'm not Iranian to argue with that. It's up to the Iranians. But me personally, and the, I argue, argue that even in Syria, a change that comes from outside doesn't last. Even a slower change that's from inside is much better. And I do believe that there is enough uh, threshold in, in Iran to make that change happen, even, even if it's slowly. Thank you, Ibrahim. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just really tough to walk through this question without being kind of frustrated from what's happening. Mm -hmm. but, but just, yeah, to echo what Ibrahim and Jensen said about the role of international community in building the capacities of civil society, um, providing technical assistance, providing humanitarian assistance to some extent. I'm just recalling Sudan experience. Like, you know, we had floods and we have genocides and conflicts and so on. So international community was there, presented kind of humanitarian support. Um, they can help with kind of limited campaigns at regional capacity or at regional level, but that's not going to have that impact that really people are looking for. So it's really hard to, to speak about the role of international community. It depends on where your country is located on the Earth's planet. When you look at Sudan, our neighbor Egypt won't be happy to see democracy in Sudan. They will strive to resist that. Emirates, you want to look at the regional powers, they, all of them, they are resisting to see transition happening in Sudan. And they strive no effort to make it collapse. And they have been like supporting, you know, the, the Burhan and the military council, like supporting them financially, technically, everything, because they maintain this kind of bilateral relation. The Sudan Army Force and rapid support militias used to take the proxy war um, on behalf of Emirates and Saudi in Yemen and in Libya. And they get paid for that. So it's kind of a very good relation. So this kind, this kind of dynamics won't make you really rely on those regional actors to support you for something. You need to find a different way where you can move and say, no, we are not happy. Yeah, we, we wanted to have a very decent relations with the international community, but we need to see where are our interests. So that's really challenging. When you look at the UN role, I mean, well, Sudan has been through everything. Sanctions, Sudan being under Chapter 6 of the UN Security Council. We had um, a peacekeeping mission in Darfur after the genocide. We have now Sudan being moved from Chapter 7 to Chapter 6, where we have the UN United Nations Integrated Transition and Assistance Mission in Sudan. All this name doing nothing. Um, um, I mean, this is kind <laughs> of. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, as, as I mentioned, we, we had, we tried, experienced every kind of intervention of international community, and it hasn't been working like that. Yeah. So uh -huh. it's only the citizens' are all. It's all about, you know, keep doing what you have been keep doing. Find new tools. Rely on the limited support that the international community can give you and build on it. I think it's just kind of, you know, we need to keep doing with different tools. Hmm. Excellent. Um, so in the context of Iran, we've seen the diaspora more united than ever um, in a unified mission and getting more involved, um, for instance, with congressional outreach. Um, what role, if any, did your respective diasporas play in shaping an outcome from abroad? Start with you, Genesis. Yes. Well, I think the diaspora in Venezuela have played a very important role, you know, their solidarity with Venezuelans from the outside have been amazing. In the worst moments of protest in Venezuela, the diaspora was always there, you know. There were protests in many cities around the world of Venezuelans outside supporting Venezuelans 
inside, you know? And I think that was very important for those who were at the moment in Caracas, in Merida, you know, like in every city in Venezuela because, well, you know that they are outside, but they are also struggling outside, you know? And, and they are outside not because they wanted to be outside, but because they didn't have another option, you know? And they are there working, trying to send money back to the family that is still in the country. So I think the role was, has always been important and it's still important today. For example, a very important fact is that today there are, well, the Venezuelan population is around 30 millions and 6.8 millions are out of Venezuela right now. So for example, if we will have a presidential election a scenario, this diaspora will play an important role. Why? Well, because the Venezuelan constitution allows Venezuelans that are not living in Venezuela to vote in presidential elections, you know? And for example, Chavez, he came into power with the support of around 3.6 millions. And right now, out of Venezuela, there are 6.8 millions. And all of those Venezuelans that are out of Venezuela, they are not supporting the regime, you know? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they left, they escaped the country because in Venezuela it was impossible to leave, you know? We were not living there, we were surviving. So yeah, the, the role of the diaspora is very important and their solidarity has been amazing all the time. Right. You know, in, in, in social support mechanisms or theory or even anything, that when happens on individual level, usually the one who is hit the most, they lean on an outer circle. So usually like people, for example, if a neighborhood was cracked down and people were detained, they lean on their relatives who are in more comfortable areas. And then those lean on the diaspora and so on. But then the diaspora actually doesn't have anyone to lean on. Yeah. And that's if, if ever anyone inside Iran would hear this, do not increase the pressure on your diaspora because they are actually also really emotionally involved. And many people inside, they forget that sometimes. They are your bloodline, they are your lifeline, they are your voice outside, they would echo your efforts, they will help you plan, they will send you aid if needed, they will support you with technology. Don't just, I know because with frustration, and that happens so much in Syria, people wake up in the morning and they start attacking everyone outside. Like whatever they say, they're like, oh, you are not inside to say that. Yeah. Oh, you will be under the AC. Oh, you have electricity. Oh, you will, they are human beings. Yes, they need to continue their lives. But they are actually, you know, sometimes I was in Syria and outside Syria. And I would tell you the emotional, the emotional pressure outside is more because you will always feel guilty. Inside, yeah. you, have, you are under, of course, pressure. You are under threat. You're risking your life, but you don't feel guilty. Yeah. Outside, once you are outside, you feel guilty. And then if you keep making your diaspora feeling too much guilty, they will just break away from you and you won't, you won't have them. Now, what the diaspora can do, of course, again, same as the leadership, to listen, to try to echo the voices, but also to be brave enough when they disagree to tell people, no, that's not okay. Just because someone is inside and someone is outside doesn't mean they are morally superior. Because sometimes people, someone inside might have a decision, uh, an opinion, someone else has another opinion. So sometimes people used to use that in Syria to silence voices uh, uh, outside. And also, of course, I see that in DC, there are always a lot of protests. And I was talking to, to one um, of my Iranian friends here. I think it's important for the diaspora to also to plan long term. And remember that it's a marathon and try to come up with ideas that help people when they join to have some fun. You know, Maha, when you say it like 1 p.m. the Zagruda, like what's, mm -hmm. what's more beautiful? Not only it helps people participate, yeah. but it also, it shows your beauty. And especially when we're talking about the Iranian culture, you know, this morning I woke up and I was like, what am I going to wear? Usually if I'm talking about a revolution, I try to be more casual. And then I was like, but not an Iranian protest. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? It's one of those cultures that really values beauty. Like you look at them, like they love colors, they love music. Show that in your revolution. Don't let the sadness take that away from you. And that's one of the things that I love and aspire in many African cultures, that even when somebody dies, they actually celebrate the life. Instead of crying over the, 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 the person.
person who passed, they try to remember and dance and say, oh, that person lived an amazing life. Try to include that more and more in, in your culture, celebrating and trying to find ways more human for people and to show your beauty doesn't mean you are not respecting or appreciating the pain of people inside Iran. Yeah. Very great point, Ibrahim. I think, yeah, for the diaspora community, I would say for people who live in Iran, in Sudan, in Syria, in Venezuela, they need, before having higher expectations from the diaspora nationals, they need to think of what kind of gaps, what kind of limitations those groups really living through. So identifying these gaps and limitations will help you not to raise your expectations and to make you be more rational in, um, in, in kind of planning your expectations because they are willing to help. They are sending donation, financial donation. Well, when you look at the Sudanese community, the sense of the solidarity is kind of social habit in Sudan. Everybody wanted to stand in solidarity with everybody, with donation, with, with everything, with financial support, with everything. So that sense is still existing. But I would say I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure about the Iranian diaspora in, in, in the US, but I'm just recalling the experience of the Sudanese diaspora community here. Till 2018, they are kind of fragile and divided because most of the Sudanese who left their countries, they left it because of their political opinions. So they brought this kind of differences here. So when they start to, join, to, to meet in a joint events, everybody stand very strong to their opinion, to their political interest, to, to their whatever kind of um, interest that they have. They, they don't think about the holistic image. Everybody thinks about their own interests. So, so this now is started to, to disappear. They understood that, understood that they have a role to, 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 to contribute through. So they started to create kind of meetings with their congressmen here mm. so as to, to speak about kind of certain policy change or calling the US government. I mean, well, I think there's a problem um, for the US administration. They don't have a clear policy um, on Sudan. So, now the, the Sudanese diaspora here, they started to organize, to have kind of meetings to identify how they will address their congressmen to make them, you know, speaking about this and try to find a way and the Congress will bring this to the surface again and have things moving for Sudan. So this is a kind of role that most of the Sudanese now and diaspora are trying to play. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to go now to Q&A. Um, this has been such an incredible conversation. I wish there was more time to like unpack all of this. But um, an interesting question was asked, and I'm going to read this verbatim. How can we assure that any efforts based in or facilitated or encouraged by the US are not seen as promoting regime change? Mm -hmm. Or is that the point, that we have a moral obligation to promote regime change in the name of promoting democracy and human rights and fighting corruption? Very long question, but an interesting one nevertheless. Any of you want to tackle that? <laughs> well, I think when it comes to addressing what the U.S., uh, how the U.S. could be representing its intervention in a certain context, I think one of the ways the U.S. can expand or increase the support to their non-state actors. So always when you intervene through the non-state actors, it could look like more friendly and more citizen to citizen. It's not addressing changing regime or imposing kind of ideologies where people don't agree on. So maybe if the U.S. committed to support their non-state agencies, non-state actors to, to help different civil societies, different non-state actors in different countries, that might be looking like, you know, from citizen to citizen. So that's one. When it comes to corruption, I mean, well, I think Speaking about sanctions, the U.S. should think of sanctions as a tool that really increase corruption, contribute to increase corruption in countries. So thinking about different ways where you can bring the regime accountable through a mechanism that really not trigger the corruption activities. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do any of you want to add to that? Or? Well, I would like to build up over your answer. And I think that you have to keep in mind that if you're talking about a regime that is corrupt, that is intentionally violating human rights, because by attacking the population, they make sure that they remain in power, you cannot pretend that you will work with them and in maybe like one or two years, they will start acting in a different way, you know, because they didn't turn into a regime, for example, in Venezuela, from one day to other. 
They have been working on their model for many years, you know? They took all the power from different branches step by step, you know? And they destroy the institutions from the inside. So it is not a problem of capability. It is not a problem of willingness. This is what they want. So, for example, in the Venezuelan case, you need to change the regime. And it is not about changing a regime for another regime. You need to eradicate regimes, you know, mm -hmm. because the fight is for democracy. Mm -hmm. So whoever is there that doesn't want to be a Democrat, that it will not respect human rights, we have to be against them. And for example, what you mentioned about civil society, you know, that's also the role of civil society. You are there to condemn every human rights violation. You are there to ask for justice, you know, you are there to, to report what is happening. So, yeah, I, I think that will be what I will add to that. Excellent. Um, I'm going to ask another question. We've only got a few more minutes. Um, so, we see that Iran has close ties with Syria and Venezuela, and they're, of course, not just on an economic and political level, but also communications on how to repress regimes to an extent, especially with the IRGC's involvement in Syria. Um, but we don't see the same communication between those fighting for freedom in these countries that you all represent today. How do we overcome that? How is it that we get freedom fighters in Iran and Venezuela and Syria and Sudan to talk to one another? And if we have, now we are doing so. <laughs> this is it's, happening right now. It's just having you know, really <laughs> create platforms like, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 And especially those who can, because I think one of the main barriers is the language. Mm -hmm. So the diaspora of each country can help creating that bridge. Usually people inside, yeah. Yeah. they don't have that, that privilege to be able to, to talk to others. And that's one of the things where Western countries can really play a huge role because you have a free society, you can over different platforms and you can get people to sit uh, and talk. Um, so I think that's one of the things that the diaspora of all these countries uh, could do that, and of course, more panels by Holly too. <laughs> of course, yeah, definitely, because these regimes they are learning from mm -hmm. each other yes. in a daily basis, you know. So we also have to learn from each other, you know. They are every day working on how to do better the repression, you know. For example, what it's happening in Venezuela right now already happened in Cuba, and then it's happening also in Nicaragua, you know. And it's exactly the same model. So they are learning, mm -hmm. and they are like improving their methods. So we have to do the same. If we don't support each other, then we will never win this fight, you know? Yeah, I think it, it's really important like for our, um, donor organizations when they plan for their interventions in whatever country, they could allocate kind of plan or fund to create this kind of a space and bring the diaspora community, bringing people from, you know, from the field or from the ground to, to bring them together. It's, it, it's, it's important if I may say it from a program language, it's important activity. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more question. How can pro-democracy frameworks be successfully created for the long term, especially for countries that have been under authoritarian regimes for decades? Anyone wanna take a stab at that first? Maha's pounder. I would say, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you have the fatigue. You need to think of how you overcome the fatigue that you will get through because you know revolution is a long life process. So um, you will feel you will feel tired. Like when you see the mandate is changed, you have it kind of become more Islamized, Islamized, Islamized mm -hmm. or jihadized. Mm -hmm. So those who have been triggered from the very first beginning, they step out. This is same happens in Sudan. I mean, when it lost its peaceful tendency, people would try to get away from it. Other people will just emotionally get ex exhausted. Some of them, they get traumatized. So you need to think of way to overcome this fatigue. Um, you need to have some of your people just thinking of that, like, you know, what kind of tools we need to bring over a certain period of time, time so to keep people interacting actively and don't feel frustrated and traumatized. Any of you want to chime in? Yes, I think that, well, first we have to learn to plan in long term, you know? Because sometimes we want to, you know, like get out of this 
like really fast. But as she mentioned, and also as I mentioned before, like these regimes, they have been building their strategy for many years, you know? So we also have to, to have the patience and the smartness, you know, to plan for years in advance, you know? Our plan cannot be like for the next three months and one year and two years, you know? We have to plan for at least five years and 10 years. And in our plan, we have to include what happened if we don't succeed in this battle, you know? Because at the end, the war, it is not only a war, it's many battles, you know? Maybe you don't win one battle, but then you will the next one, you know? And, and you have to be ready for all of those uh, scenarios. So yeah, I, I think that planning in long term, it's important, but also understanding that from, when, from whatever you fight, it's important your fight, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you don't have to be in the country. You don't have to be outside the country. You don't have to be a member of a human rights NGO. You don't have to be a member of a political party. From whatever you are and whoever you are, you can play an important role. And that is something that you have to discover. Nobody can tell you how to fight mm -hmm. and where to fight. That must be your own commitment, and you will be committed just if you understand from where you can play your role. Excellent. Thank you for and, and to incorporate all of these values in and within the bodies of civil society and opposition, and that's something that could start today. And democracy is, democracy is hearing what you don't like and living with those you disagree with. So that's something you really can start today by showing also the Iranian people what the alternative will look like when, when, there, are, when there is also a focus not only on democracy, democracy, but also on freedom of expression, on accepting minority voices, on accepting those who disagree and have different visions without venalizing them or without saying they, they really don't believe in the revolution or attacking them and, and their ethics, etc. I think that's, that's a great start and that's really how those values will be uh, uh, supported to grow within the, the society. No matter what happens on the government level, that something could and should uh, be built within society. Yeah. Just to add yeah. for that uh, kind of quick, communication. I mean, yeah. identifying your communication strategy is or, is or between those civil society bodies or between the citizens themselves. Mm -hmm. You need to have your backup plan when you get through internet shutdown, censorship, and so on. So communication is something really helping to keep continue you know, sharing this kind of messages and so on. And also understanding the weaknesses and strengths of your coalitions, understand mm -hmm. this, understand this coalition has its limitation and don't expect that, expect that much from them. Try to work by yourself to create incentive for them to come over this kind of weaknesses. And then by this way, you can continue moving on this long trajectory. Thank you so much. Um, it was really an honor to have the three of you here to help us talk about what Iran's protesters can learn from you and your respective countries. Um, I want to plug in a couple of items. Um, one, Ibrahim actually wrote us a beautiful piece um, earlier, um, I believe it was in December, um, about lessons learned for, from Syria for Iran's protesters that I highly recommend that you read and to also um, subscribe to our newsletter on Iran called The Iranist, and finally to join us for future events where we'll be continuing the conversation on Iran, the protests, and democratization in Iran. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.